In my last video I showed how to create chess by using TensorFlow, but the result was as if the model was making random moves. In this video I will show you the same approach with slider notifications using PyTorch, the result will be way better, so buckle up. I will recap all the details I discussed in the previous video, but if you would like to understand the code in more detail, then I recommend watching that video as well. In this video I will show you how to parse data, how to train neural network, how to make predictions and, in the end, I will analyze a couple of games played against the engine. Without further ado, let's dive in. You might ask, why PyTorch? Well, if you are into deep learning, then you generally have only two options, PyTorch and TensorFlow. Or you may write everything in C from scratch if you are Andrew Carpathy. PyTorch and TensorFlow are always competing with each other. Sometimes the latter prevails, sometimes the former. In recent years, PyTorch has been considered to be a more flexible library. On the whole, I recommend knowing how to use both of them. In my repository I have a directory called Engines, which contains two subdirectories. The first one, TensorFlow, is from the last video. The one we'll be focusing on is the second one, Torch. It contains five different files, but don't be afraid, some of them are quite simple. And I'll go gently through all of them. The main file here is called train, let's have a look at it. The first step is to load the data. All my data is kept in the data PGN directory, where each file is in PGN format, which is a text format to store chess games. Each file contains many games and I'm parsing these files into a single array called games. As you can see we have 41,570 games here. Each object in this array is of type game. Game is a class from a chess library. This is the library that I will be using throughout the video. Now we need to convert this array of games into arrays or to be more precise into tensors that will fit into the neural network in the future. Here I imported two functions from another file called auxiliary functions. Let's have a look at this file. I thoroughly explained this code in the previous video, but I made a slight modification here and let me just recap what's going on here. The first function board to matrix converts a board object, which I imported from chess library, into a matrix of numbers. I initialized this matrix with zeros, and in the last video this number wasn't 13, it was 12. It is the size of a matrix, 13 by 8 by 8, 8 by 8 is the size of a chess board, and 13, what's this? 12 is a number of unique pieces, like black bishop or white king, and I have another board for legal moves. So the last board, 13th board, tells the model where it can move the pieces, because in the last video the model didn't capture my pieces as if it didn't know that it could go there. You might treat this object as an image. 8 by 8 is the number of pixels, where each pixel is either 0 or 1 in our case, and 13 is the number of channels. In images it usually equals 3, which corresponds to RGB. In our case we have 13 channels, where first 12 channels illustrate pieces, and the last one illustrates where we can move our pieces. Here is also a function create input for neural network that I used in the train file to create arrays x and y. What are x and y basically? Each element of x is the position of the board during the game, and the target is the next move for that position, the UCI format made in that game. The UCI form is pretty much simple, it specifies two squares from which you want to move your piece and where you want to move your piece. We have more than 3 million samples here, but I cut these arrays because of memory considerations, and then I convert target from uh, moves in UCI format to natural numbers, because neural network cannot deal with string objects, it can deal only with numbers. And the final step is to convert these NumPy arrays into tensors, torch tensors, because PyTorch can operate only with torch tensors. Finally, we are done with preparing the data and we are ready to use PyTorch. In PyTorch, you always need to do three things. First, create a custom class for a dataset. Second, create a custom class for the model. And third, write a training loop. Let's start with the dataset. Here is a custom dataset. It is located in the separate file called dataset.py. And our class called chess dataset inherits from the class dataset, which I imported from Torch. Dataset is an abstract class representing a dataset. All datasets that represent a map from keys to data samples should subclass it. All subclasses should override get item, supporting fetching a data sample for a given key, and subclasses could also optionally override len. This is what I'm doing here. Here's also an init method, 
which is called when you create an instance of your class, it plainly saves the data. And here's also a land method that returns a number of samples in the dataset and get item returns a single sample from the dataset given a key index. That's it for the dataset. Let's have a look at the custom model. Here's the class chess model. It inherits from the module, which I imported from Torch. And module is a base class for all neural networks modules. Your module should also subclass this class. Here's an example of implementation of this class. It must contain init method and forward. In the init method, you should also initialize this object with everything from the parent class. Well, my init method takes an argument number of classes, which is a number of unique moves in the dataset. In my case, I need this number to set the architecture of the neural network. And here's the architecture itself. It starts with two convolutional layers, because as I said before, our input is basically an image with 13 channels. And dealing with images, convolutional layers are really powerful and can catch many patterns. As an activation function, I chose rectify linear unit, then I'm using flatten to vectorize the matrix and fully connect layers at the end. And I'm saving all these layers as fields of my object, then I initialize weights. But you can skip this step because PyTorch has built-in default initialization for various layers. The function forward implements forward propagation by going through all these layers and it returns row logits, which after applying a softmax function can be interpreted as probabilities. Let's go back to the main notebook. I imported our custom classes and here I am creating an instance of a chess dataset. It takes two arguments, x and y, which are tensors that I created before. Then I'm creating a data loader. What's this? I imported the data loader from Torch here to be load data during the training process. You can specify quite a lot of parameters here, but three of them are crucial. The first one is the data set, of course, which I created in the previous line, then a batch size, which determines how many samples you feed into your neural network in one iteration, and the final one is shuffle, which you should usually set to true during the training process, except for situations where orders of great importance, such as in the time series forecasting problems where you're dealing with sequential data. Next, I'm checking whether a GPU is available, and in my case, it is available, but if you don't have GPU, then you will train your model using CPU. Then I initialize the model, passing a number of classes, and as a criterion, I chose cross entropy loss, which is standard practice when dealing with the classification task. This is exactly what we are doing, predicting the best move for a given position among many moves. As an optimizer, I chose Atom, which is the best to start with. Finally, the last step, the training loop. I know it might not be easy for you, but if you get to this point, you're doing great. I won't go into detail here. I will probably make another video about generally how to use PyTorch with more details. But in general, here's what happens. We iterate over a number of epochs. And during each epoch, we iterate over our dataset using a data loader. So a data loader is, in essence, an object that is iterable over the whole dataset. Here's the number of iterations during one epoch. This number can be obtained directly. You need to divide the length of the dataset by the batch size. In my case, the length of the dataset is the length of x, which is 2.5 million. And batch size equals 46. It was here. Batch size equals 46. So this number equals approximately 2.5 million over 64. I've already completed the training process and I actually have two models. I saved them here. I trained the first one on a small data set using, as far as I remember, 800,000 samples. Not that much of a small data set, but smaller than the one that I'm currently using but I completed only 10 epochs, though the convergence was much better than with the model that I implemented using TensorFlow. The second model was trained on a larger dataset using 2.5 million samples and 100 epochs. Each epoch took 91 seconds, so the whole training process was finished in about 2.5 hours using GeForce 4060. Here I'm saving the model and the mapping. Don't forget to save the mapping because it will be required for predictions. This brings us to the final file where we will use the model. Here's the file predict and I don't think this file is of any particular interest to go through. I mean, I load the mapping, I check for a GPU, I load the model and then I simply use this model. As in the last video, I choose the move with the highest probability among legal moves. What is important here is how do you use all of this? First, let's run all these cells. And first, we need to initialize a chessboard. Let's have a look at this board. 
you might remember that in the last video I was printing the board this way and I said that this is somewhat a beautiful representation of the board. But then I discovered that without print it returns something more beautiful. Here we go. Basically it all comes down to which magic method is being called. There are two magic methods, wrapper and stir. Anyway, then you need to make a move. You can do it without engine, call a function called push UCI and pass a move in the UCI format. This is UCI form which I mentioned before and let's try to make a move and have a look at the board. And exactly in the same way we can ask Mile to make moves. First we need to predict the move, we call the function predict move and pass an object board. It returns the best move for this position, for this board object. Then all we need to do is push this move into this board. So let's try this and here we go. This is the move that the engine made. We can continue running the cell and see the game. Well, now I'm gonna play the whole game here. I can make my moves in this way and then I can ask model to make the move. But it's not really convenient here because I cannot draw any arrows to show you some lines. So I'll play the whole game here and then I will export it into lichess.org. You can do it with this line of code. It returns a game in the PGN format. You can copy this line and insert it into lichess.org. And now it is time to play. Here we go. E4, E5 on the board. I went knight f3, knight c6, and we are playing Rue Lopez, Spanish opening, a very common one. It is a Murphy defense, exchange variation. Honestly, at this moment I was amazed how well he's playing the opening. And here we enter the middle game. According to the stalkers, he's doing better than me, but let's see what happens then. I attack the center, and the whole middle game is about trades. And here we go. He attacked my queen. At this moment I was honestly afraid that he might win, he's playing a solid game. So we traded one more piece and here we go. He's about to make his first blunder. This is a blunder, rook d4, because now I can go queen c8 and this is a check. He'll protect himself and now I will take his pawns. So this is a blunder because now his pawns are so vulnerable. I can take his pawns, especially this one. I will support my pawn with a rook and then this pawn will stride until it becomes a queen. So this game is over. My position is so good at this moment. But actually I didn't notice that. And instead of seizing this great opportunity to win the game, I answer with a blunder. I see a blunder, I answer with a blunder. And he took my pawn. Now I actually went c8, but this isn't good as it was. Because first he took my pawn on e4, now he's about to take one more pawn. And what's more is that, assume I'll go b7 and he'll go c5. This is a check, I need to save my king, g2, and he protects his pawn. Now he'll take my pawn and after I capture his, he might go d6. Well, my position is better here according to the stockfish, but it's a complex one, I would say, at least for me. So this is now what happened. Uh, let's go back and let's take a close look at this position. How many moves does he have? He might go d8 or e8, but these moves are obviously blunders. I would take his queen, the game is over. And he might go f7. But this is a terrible move, because of this, check, and I'll capture his rook. Or what is even better here is that I can go e5, now he has only one move, and after this I'll again capture his rook. So, out of four moves, one, two, three, four, only one move will keep him afloat. This is queen f8, and three other moves are blunders. But at this position he chose a blunder. He went queen e8. And that's it. I took his queen and it's even a checkmate. So the game is completely over. Look at the computer analysis. He played a really decent opening. Then he was relatively well during the middle game. And there are some blunders in the end game. Alright. I was excited about how well this model is. So I decided maybe I should feed it more data. And finish let's say 100 epochs. That is what I did, and let's see the result. Here is the second game. 
This time he answered with the Sicilian defense, and the only way that I know how to play against this is a lapping variation. So I go pawn c3, and his move is pawn d5. Accurate move, and actually the following 10 moves are pretty much accurate. No, no mistakes from my side, no mistakes from his side. We're playing an accurate opening. So we enter the middle game with approximately equal positions, and at this point I decide that I want to play aggressively. I go queen e2. I'm attacking his bishop and I want to check if he blunders it. He didn't blunder. He goes queen d6, protecting his bishop, but I continue pressing. I go knight e4. I'm attacking his queen and he didn't blunder this as well. I take his knight. According to the stockfish, his position is better and now he's winning, but he made a blunder. Rook g8. Now I take his rook and the game is over. After a couple of moves, I checkmated him. That's it. Well, we are observing the same pattern, a nice opening, followed by a relatively good middle game and eventually one blunder that leads to a disaster. What could greatly improve this is implementing an algorithm that detects whether a move is a blunder. It could be a simple recursion or check for checkmates or significant material losses or perhaps another neural network. If you're still watching this video, you're great, thank you. Personally, I'm excited about how well the model performs. It starts exceptionally strong and surprisingly it maintains a relatively decent level through the middle game, probably around 1500 to 1800 ELO. However, as you have seen, it inevitably blunders in the end game. As mentioned earlier, implementing a basic algorithm to detect blunders could significantly improve overall performance. If you have any ideas for further improvements or anything else you'd like to discuss, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Have a great day!